the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Is there anyone here for public input? Two-minute public input? Need, if there is, I need you to come to that, that podium and give me your name and your address, please, sir. Uh, I think this is public input. I'm not sure. My name is Isidore Leiser. I live at 560 2nd Avenue South in Wade Park, or probably better known as 2nd Avenue Raceway. But anyhow, I have a question. Of, I was wondering what it, I've talked to some of my neighbors, and we were wondering what it would take to get a couple digital radar, radar speed signs on 2nd Avenue, I say a couple of them because probably one going each way. So it would possibly slow the traffic down from going over 50 miles an hour down to at least under 40 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour speed zone. There is one on the, on the end of town when you come there's, into town. There's four on four different roads coming into 2nd Avenue, but none on 2nd Avenue where the real problem is. But in four different roads coming in Second Avenue, yeah. there's one. Yeah. All right. So, okay, uh, we can look at that. We well, we don't make any decisions tonight. I know. So but we, we can put I'm, that on our agenda and and we can talk about it at a work session and see what we can come up with. Maybe the chief got has got some ideas or something or to see what we can do. Would you mind giving Carlo over here your phone number? Um, and then we can follow up with you to let you know what the results of that stuff are, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, if you could do a study yep. on that, that would be great. Then we can at least, so you can, you don't have to come back here. We can contact, if you're certainly welcome to come back here, but we can certainly follow up with you to let you know what we've done. Yeah. Well, you'll be, if you, you'll, or know what the results of that were, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else for in two-minute input? Anyone else? All right, review and approve council agenda. Any additions or anything? Move to approve. All second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously for those of us here. Consent agenda items. Item A, approve special animal license request, and item B, uh, approve 7-19-2021 city council meeting minutes. Approve? Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously. Item A, Ordinance 61 and Appendix B, Fee Schedule Amendments. You all right with me doing it from here, or would you like me to? I'm good with you doing it from there. Okay. Uh, so there's a couple of items with Ordinance 61 that are uh, needing to just be buttoned up and finished. First is Paul. when... I believe it's on. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I'll lean in. You gotta uh, talk into it a little bit. <laughs> all right, Ordinance 61. Uh, this is the ordinance that regulates the parking and towing within the jurisdiction of the city. We had looked at this ordinance in a prior meeting as well. Uh, in the prior meeting, we were dealing with uh, changes to parking regulations in certain parts of the city. Uh, but we noted that there were a couple of items with the ordinance that also needed to get buttoned up. One of those is that uh, the legislature of the state of Minnesota, they made changes to the numbering of some of the statutes that we apply to the ordinance. So one is really just uh, to correct the fact that the ordinance uh, is citing the statutes that are renumbered. So we've gone through and everywhere in the ordinance where we had the old legislative numbering, that has been brought current. Uh, the other item is that the expressed intent of the council and of the recommendations from the chief of police was to ensure that the parking restrictions with respect to commercial vehicles would be applicable basically 24-7, 365 days. The idea being that there is no period in time where the safety of the public or the flow of traffic meaningfully changes such that a commercial vehicle parked in that area would be tolerable or permissible. The old version of the ordinance indicated that, that no commercial parking would only be during weekdays and really during the daytime hours. It had a provision in there saying 8 o'clock until 6 p.m. 
So that portion of the language was removed to have the effect of no commercial vehicle parking would be at any time. There would be no time period where a semi, for example, could park in a no commercial vehicle area. So we made that change to meet the stated uh, intent and preference of the council. And then the last item that I made in the ordinance was, I noted that there's a point in the ordinance where it talks about the discretion of the uh, police department to have a impoundment order. There's another section in the ordinance where it suggests, at least it's ambiguous, that you would have to have three parking violations in order to trigger the impoundment option. I don't believe that that's the way that that ordinance would actually be applied, but recognizing that in the review, I decided that it would be appropriate to put in front of the council as a recommendation additional language that specifies that if the police department establishes a good cause for this being problematic to safety or the flow of traffic, that they would be able to order that impoundment. The ordinance as originally written has that authority in it by my reading of it, but just making sure there's no ambiguity was the purpose for that. Final so, item, very simple final item there, is uh, we had an amendment to the fee schedule that was a change in the, um, in, the, uh, in the fine that would be affiliated with different types of tickets. And so that's just included in here as an acknowledgement that that fee schedule was amended as well. Okay. Um, um, going back, that would be under section 61.16, subdivision three, the impoundment of vehicles. Um, it says a violator in this section receives three consecutive parking citations. The city police department may impound and tow the vehicle. Um, what language, or would you just strike that out of there and allow it to go back to the other? Oh, the proposed oh, change. To it. The proposed change is the addition of a sentence: a vehicle may be impounded immediately where the city police department determines the vehicle poses a hazard to the safety of vehicles or pedestrians or the orderly flow of traffic. So that would just be added in that section? Yes, that would, that would follow right after the sentence that, uh, that you had noted in that section. So just one set sentence would be inserted after. And I believe I, that what I'm that- tr <laughs> I'm truly thinking that it should be only two consecutive parking citations. One, especially in the winter time, if it's a hazard, but then if you add that line that gives the discrimination to the officer to have that vehicle towed if in fact it's causing more obstruction? Oh, uh, in another section of the ordinance in 61.15, so just before the section that you're citing to, there uh, it notes that any vehicle left parked or standing in violation of the ordinance or the laws of the state of Minnesota may be towed and then continues and explains. So we already have a section in there that says that if there's a reason, if there's a justifiable reason for impoundment, that authority is already in the ordinance. But I just noted that in the next section of the ordinance, it indicates that essentially uh, items that would not normally call for impoundment, if you commit that same act three times, then that could subject you to impoundment. So if someone parks where they shouldn't, uh, but it's, let's say that they've parked in a handicap spot and they don't have handicap stickers or they don't have any right to be there. And you see that same vehicle three times or it's not moved over the course of three days, then you'd have the option to impound it out of such a parking spot. But when I read that second section of the ordinance, I thought it'd be appropriate to put a clarification in that it's not modifying or limiting 61.15, but rather is talking about like a separate incidence where you know, the fact that somebody has committed the same offense three times in a row or has failed to move their car within 24 hours, 72 hours, whatever the, the number might be for a given infraction, that impoundment is available for that as well. It seems that we have impoundment for uh, where it's deemed appropriate and impoundment as you haven't paid attention to these citations that you've gotten, so we're gonna get your attention by impounding your vehicle. It seems to be that that's what the ordinance is really offering. So this is not only just for commercial, but also regular vehicles? Correct, there are instances where a regular vehicle could in theory be impounded if it were posing a real risk. If somebody had parked their vehicle 
uh, on a street that's no parking period than any vehicle that was parked in such a way could be impounded because it's posing a threat to the traffic, it's posing a threat to pedestrians, depending upon how it's parked. And the three consecutive parking citations would go for a motor vehicle as well as a commercial. Yes. Okay. Council, May anything else? Oh, May Chief. I? Yep, Chief. Uh, I, I just uh, want the council to be clear. The, the reason that we're asking me for a more aggressive policy or ordinance related to commercial vehicles is the problem that we're having is m many of the trucks that are being parked on the public street are part of a lease fleet. So when we run that vehicle, we have no way of knowing who the driver is. Many times we don't, don't even know who the real owner is. Um, it just indicates that it's leased. So when it, it, we could have a truck A there tonight and truck B will be there tomorrow. And so there's no way that you're going to, we're going to be able to keep track of who has three violations or because the same truck might not be back for ever. Um, so that is, that is the challenge we have with holding the drivers of these vehicles accountable. Um, we write a parking citation and currently, you know, previously until, you know, assuming this one's approved, it was $10, they just ignore it. They wouldn't, and we had no way of knowing who to go after for that unpaid $10 parking ticket. So. That's the issue. It's, it's very hard for us to try to um, do the three violation thing with a lot of these commercial vehicles. Some of the trucks, we, can, we know who the owner is and we can call the trucking company and say, hey, your drivers are leaving their cars or trucks on the street overnight. Tell them to stop, they will. But that's not always the case. And, and so that's, I just wanted to make sure that um, the issue of three warnings uh, is not what, what I was hoping for. Um, if we have a truck there, uh, and we'll do our best to, to you know, log the, the plate on the trailer as well as on the, on the semi, but um, uh, until we can have some teeth, if you will, in our ordinance, higher fine rates, potential for booting a vehicle, such that the driver then has to come in and take care of um, his fines, then we're not going to be able, we're not really addressing the issue. Does that, I hope that makes some sense. It says three or more consecutive parking citations or by continuing to park a vehicle in a no parking zone. So I, I don't think you need three to do that. Right, no, the, the, this might have been a part where I wasn't entirely clear or, so you know, I'll, 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 I'll elaborate. I just wanted to make sure that the council yeah. was clear yeah. that we're, and, and I, I get it, I mean, yep. we're okay. on the same, but right. it's just um, yeah. that, that it's not gonna be a matter of necessarily having three violations no. before. Okay. No, 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 there's, there's no. a pre-existing portion of the ordinance that says that if an individual, for example, got three parking citations, the same car got three parking yep. citations, that could be escalated to an impoundment. Sure. But if it's someone who's in a no parking zone, and we've said that that, we have a provision in the ordinance that says you can impound that vehicle if it's not taken care of. If you have a semi that's in a no trucks ever parking area, then the mere presence would be sufficient for the police department to uh, accelerate that to impoundment. But you have this, the, the ordinance as written has this secondary option of the event of uh, you know, something that would be a routine or smaller infraction where it's not in and of itself a threat to the public safety or to the flow of traffic, but is a repeat of the same violation with the same vehicle, then the failure to acknowledge the citations could be met with an impoundment yeah. of that vehicle. So there's, there's no expectation or thought that three citations would be, or three instances of an infraction would have ever been required in the no commercial vehicle parking zone. And when it, you know, if there are on those occasions where we can 
identify who the owner and or driver of any vehicle, we will certainly, um, that, that's a whole different game. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so if we put uh, the no parking commercial vehicle, uh, a normal car or whatever could still park in that area? Is that right? Or if it's no parking. parking, no parking. No right? parking for any kind of vehicle. For any kind of vehicle? Right. Okay. A car would be subject to a, uh, a fine. And they would, you know, typically those um, uh, finding the accountable person or the owner is not difficult for cars. Um, it's, it's, it's these commercial vehicles that it becomes a problem. I was just wondering, the way you were kind of stating it was no commercial vehicle parking, but that includes everything. No, we want to maintain that no parking for any vehicle. Okay. On those roads. Okay. Council, anything else? If not, I'd entertain a motion to either approve or deny uh, Ordinance 61 parking towing appendix B fee schedule and summary publication. I'll go ahead and uh, approve it with uh, the added sentence. It's already in one. there. It's already in there. Is it in there? Yeah, right here, Department of Discretion. The last sentence in that one. So he was going to add one. Oh, right here. Oh, it's it's included in the amendment. Yeah. Uh, oh, it the, is. The cop, yeah, I, the copy in front of me is a red line copy, and it's included in that amendment proposal. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously. Thank you. Item B, Miller Lease to Purchase Agreement. Are you, Shauna? Yeah, it could be either one of us, actually. Okay. I'll start, and then how okay. about you can fill in. <laughs> sure. Um, so what you have in front of you um, is a um, lease-to-purchase agreement um, for a piece of property that Miller owns um, that is just, um, just it is between BioLife and the amphitheater um, on the south side of Parkway Drive. And if you recall, we have been looking at um, some additional land um, to serve um, a need of considering a future public safety facility. Um, and I've also um, looked at potentially needing some additional parking for the amphitheater. Um, and so a couple of the ideas that we had were looking at this particular piece of property um, that is adjacent to the amphitheater. Um, it is a total of 17 acres. Um, we have discussed this with Miller. Um, the cost to purchase this land is $2.7 million. And if you recall, we've also gone to the legislature to um, seek the ability to um, put on our 2022 um, uh, election a referendum um, looking at purchasing, or excuse me, for, for us to be able to um, do two projects, one would be for a public safety facility and then the other one was for trails. And as part of that, that gives us some mechanisms for um, assisting with funding of this particular project for the Miller site. Um, so for us, what we were looking at doing was try to come up with a win-win situation where we would be able to um, work into securing the property today um, for the price of the $2.7 million. Um, but looking at purchasing it in the future. And so how we came to that, and I know we've had some preliminary discussions with the council related to this, is we've looked at the assessments as an option. There are um, assessments on that particular property, um, and what we were looking at doing was um, for every year that we lease the property, um, we would forego um, a third of the assessments, which is in a sense essentially a kind of a lease payment to the city. Um, and so that's the idea of this with the idea that we would also purchase this property no later than uh, December 31st of 2023. In the agreement that is in front of you, there's also provision that if the sales tax referendum in the 2022 general election is not approved, um, that this agreement would become null and void. Um, and so that is what's in front of you today. It's, it's kind of a way for us to secure some property. It allows us to utilize it for the parking needs of the amphitheater now. 
um, and gives us a little bit more flexibility until we can determine directions moving forward. Um, we don't necessarily have to purchase, uh, we don't necessarily have to use the sales tax proceeds to purchase the property. If we choose to get other funding mechanisms, if we choose to go forward with bonding or any other mechanisms that we may find, we could certainly purchase that with Miller before that um, sales tax referendum. Um, and so that would be really what we would need to look at is, is that because we can't control what that sales tax referendum is, and so if we really want to look at securing it, we may want to look at other options as well. So that's kind of a high overview of, of what's being proposed, and I'd be happy to answer any questions, or Paul too. Paul is the one that's drafted this agreement, and Rick and I are the, the two that worked with Paul and Miller to come to the, to the agreement that's in front of you. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Council, got any questions? <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Good grief. Sorry. Are there no, any, no worries. Are there any questions on this agreement? No, I'd make a, I would make a motion um, to accept the uh, proposal um, to approve the Miller Lease Purchase Agreement as presented. I'll second. I just have one thing to say. I want to make darn sure that the four of us sitting here know exactly what this agreement says. I'm very comfortable with it. I've read it very thoroughly. And I am going to take a roll call vote on this, just on this. I guess my question is, there's some payoff each year on this, which is, you know, a third and I believe in third, another, a third and a third. another portion, something about buying it for a dollar. That's, that's, so a, that's the annual rent payment for it. Yeah. That's the annual. The, yeah. That's our, the, we, have, we owe them a dollar every year just so that shows the good intent yeah. that we're going to, mm -hmm. that we're yeah. in the process. Yeah. The other the piece that you're reading, Mike, is the assessment, the third of the assessments, um, that, that portion of it every year. So if we are in a lease agreement January 1st of that year, correct? I'm looking at Paul because I want to make sure that I got this right. Mm. That, that then forgoes that assessment for that year that third of that assessment. Do we know, do we know approximately how much that would be? Approximately $60,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And is that, would that amount come off of the total price at the end? No, that is our cost of utilizing that As part property. of maybe a down payment on it? No. No, either way, if you buy it, you're going to pay it one way or the other because it's it's mm -hmm. part of their, you know, if they're well, going to sell. I understand that, but yeah. it, it, no. that amount would still come off a little bit. You know, in two years, you'd have 120000 or whatever mm -hmm. as part of a down payment to the package. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't. This is, that 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 agreement is so that Miller will take this piece of property basically off the market for three years. That's their insurance that we're going to buy this. That's a reasonable approach, I think. Well, I agree. and is there the the way out is if this doesn't get voted or we cannot come up with the funding? Well, yeah, now, and here it just mentions the half percent. So if that's we have the ability to pay for it any other way we wanted to, but we would want to look. We could, yeah. but if we can't. Then, then we'll have to go back and renegotiate with it. Then it would just it. automatically fall out. And this agreement is no longer it. valid, and we would have to look at securing another type There's of an agreement. There's no penalties. Not for that. No, not for that. No. No, no the, right, the, uh, the concept being that in exchange for the assessments each year, you're, you're preserving the opportunity to be the buyer. At that cost. At that cost. And then, you know, as a, an alternative, conceivably, would be for, if this didn't exist, was for Miller to see what the market would, uh, what the property would go for on the market. But with this agreement, they're saying, we'll lock in a $2.7 million number, and we understand that, uh, speaking for Miller, they understand that, or, or rather paraphrasing them, I can't speak for them, I need to clarify that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they recognize that our capacity as the city to purchase is dependent upon, or you know, that's the quickest and easiest road, the outcome of that vote. And so, uh, since that vote won't happen until November on the referendum, 
And because there's been a relationship between the city and Miller, they've said, we'll entertain this possibility of you purchasing at 2.7 million, but to have that option, one third of the assessments each year is our request. So one way to think about it is that the price of the, of the property is 2.7 plus the total value of the assessments, but we're basically making those payments now to preserve that opportunity to buy the property at the back end. Okay, as you know, if things happen in the future to the economy, there's usually a large fluctuation in real estate and property value. Is there anything in here that would, if in fact the property values fell quite a bit, that we could get a lesser price or are we locked in at the 2.7 right now until three we years We don't anticipate from now? it going down. We this that 2.7 is already uh, a, a cut rate price uh, because they they do appreciate Way Park and and they have given us a, a Way Park price on that. To be honest with you, I'm just looking at all the no, no, things that right. can happen in the next three years. That you know the price of my house may go up or it may go down. Yep. You know so. Um, well, you same. still have at the end of that you have the ability it, to not buy to it. not buy it. Yeah, we have the right not to buy it. Well, I understand. You have the right I'm to get out of the agreement. You know, that would be the case. Looking for ways to, to deal a little bit maybe in the future. But if this is going to lock it in, you know, and if it is at a reduced price for the property and already. If we ever felt like the price went down beyond what it is right now, you have the ability to, to get out of the agreement with a notice. We don't have to renew it, right, if I remember correctly? I didn't see that in there, that's why. I thought that's, didn't either party have the ability? No, that part, but that part was removed. Okay. Took that out because there's a, wanted, there's an right. early term, there's an early termination, too. termination in the lease, but that's in the circumstances where uh, the, the referendum fails and, you know, there's no, there's okay. no way for us to go forward yeah. with Miller and say, there's a source of funding, it's here. Right. If, if that's not, you know, available to us, then that would terminate it. But we're, we're saying that, or the way that this is structured is saying that Wade Park has every intention of purchasing this property, yep. provided that the funding is available. Yep. And that's part of, that's the other part of what's, uh, I believe, brought Miller to the table, right. is one, you have a serious buyer, two, your serious buyer is willing to put some uh, serious uh, consideration on the table in the form of the assessments. And Miller looks over and thinks, well, we're delaying a payment to ourselves, and obviously money sooner is more valuable than money later, uh, just in the fact that you can use it and you can make purpose with it. So uh, I think that the discussions that have gone forth so far have done a good job of just balancing the interests of both, and, and yet here the city is still looking at a pretty favorable uh, opportunity being extended by Miller. Council, anything else? Any other questions on it? Council Member Schmidt. Yes. Council Member Schultz. Yes. Council Member Lindquist. Yes. Uh, and Mayor Miller, yes. Make sure the records show that that was a roll call, roll call vote. Council Member uh, Tyson is not here. All right. We got that done. Granite View Road, change order number three. I think that would be John be me. This is the change order you've heard me talk about and update you on the last couple of months. There's a there's a few smaller items from 2nd Street North and a few on Granite View Road. I won't go line item by line item, but in large part, what happened here is subgrade soils, once we opened up Granite View Road, the subgrade soils we found to be uh, not as suitable as we'd anticipated going into this. And so through a couple of site meetings, uh, with myself and Public Works and Braun Intertech and the contractor, uh, the, the approach to build, essentially to build a lasting road here, which is the goal of all of ours, was to change the road section. Uh, we added 18 inches of sand or select granular borrow, which also meant we had to add some subgrade excavation to get rid of the bad material and bring in some good clean sand for 18 inches. Uh, we did also kind of compensate that by reducing the class five from eight inches down to six inches. With all that sand underneath, that added a lot of robust granular uh, base that we were able to do that. 
uh, this change order does also just contractually subtract off that bus turn lane at the amphitheater. We, we aren't going to do that, so contractually this subtracts that off. Uh, ultimately, the, this all washes out to a change order of $34,011.41. And with that, I will answer any questions you might have. Council, any questions for John? When is that road proposed to be done? It is done other than wear course and shouldering essentially. And we, with all this subgrade work we did, we kind of asked the contractor to wait to do that final lift to wear course till late August, early September, something in that time frame, just in case uh, area that wasn't compacted quite right or something settles, we can get that dealt with before the wear course is on. So we're kind of by design asking them to wait, but I'd say it'll be done by roughly mid-September. Are those signs gonna come down or are you gonna leave those up? Well, we're, we're leaving them up just because without the shouldering down, you've got kind of those, it's, it's not quite finished. So, you know, to be on the cautious side of leaving the signs up for now is the, the direction. Anything else for John? I don't think the motion down there is right, but it's all right. We have a motion for to, to approve change order number three. Yeah, I know that's true. <laughs> So what's the change order number? 34,000. Change order number three. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess my question really quick on this would be, uh, do we have enough money in the surplus to cover this <coughs> under this? I mean, we're awfully it's tight or close, but is there I'll enough? I'll attempt to answer that, not yeah. being in the financial records, but We've actually seen some cost savings on other areas of right. this project where the overages aren't going to be as substantial as this. It's probably going to be in the, I think I estimated $15,000 plus or minus range. And if you remember right, when we opened bids on our project for this summer, I think we were 60 or 70,000 under our budget. So it'll just, it'll be just fine. Be all right. I'll move to approve change second. order. I'll second. Further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously. And item D, determination of adequacy of EIS of Martin Marietta North Quarry reduction and Rainbow Quarry expansion. Good evening. Good evening. There you go, that's right. <laughs> Could you talk into the microphone, please? Yeah, thank you. No, is it on? Doesn't, nope. Is there a little green button? A little green button, or a little red button, yeah? Oh, oh well, anyway. There oh. you go. There it is. Is that there working you. out? Yes. Okay. So, anyway, I'm Joel Last with SCH, and uh, we've been assisting John Nurnberger with the city of uh, Wade Park, obviously, and Jim Merrick with uh, Martin Marietta on the formatting review and submittal of Martin Marietta's voluntary in environmental impact statement, which is an EIS. This is kind of an alphabet soup, so I'm trying to explain some of those to begin with. And then uh, that gets submitted to the state of Minnesota's EQB. Long and short, the purpose of a EIS is to provide information about the potential environmental impacts from a project, <coughs> excuse me, and how they may be avoided and minimized. Wade Park gets to be the responsible government unit, which kind of means Wade Park kind of gets to be the signer and author of the document. And then uh, with that, with the RGU, the city has to review and disclose any environmental effects of the proposed future projects. The EIS is not an approval or disapproval of a project. It just serves as a source of information for everybody in the future as they're working through the approval process. So uh, the RGU is uh, laid out who gets to be do that. There's a Minnesota Rules 4410. Um, tonight, as you guys said, you get to uh, one of the final steps and it's the uh, review of whether the EIS is uh, determination to be adequate for the process. So. Just a little background, in the fall of 2020, Martin Marietta contacted the city of Wade Park regarding the completion 
of the voluntary EIS for the expansion of their Rainbow Quarry pit and a reduction of the North Quarry. The city contacted the, myself at SCH to help do the environmental process. Um, the proposed tasks completed in summary just kind of goes here as follows. They're going to reduce the North Quarry from 129 acres down to about 120. The Rainbow Quarry is going to get expanded from the existing 52 acres to approximately 95. In the process of uh, EIS, we have to go through multiple things. Uh, the first step was the scoping environmental assessment worksheet. And basically they do that to narrow down what are the environmental problems for the thing. An EAW is a large document. And then to get it down to the EIS, we identify what are the real problems with the, the proposed project, the particular one, and then move on from there. So. Uh, we did that, sent it out to all of the regulatory agencies as a big list on the EQB. And you kind of get that narrowed down. And the big things for this site was uh, the typical things with the wetlands, threatened endangered species, storm water, water appropriations, and where they're sending their water, the receiving waters of stuff. So after we did that, then we did a draft EIS, sent it out to all those same people again for their review. Um, well, the first time with the the scoping EAW had like eight comments. With the draft EIS that came back, we had two comments, kind of related to restoration plans and the restoration. Then we did the final EIS, and we came back with one comment dealing with threatened and endangered species. So we've done virtual public meetings. We put the notices in the St. Cloud Times, and we followed the process you know, laid out for the EQB for you guys. So the largest impact with the quarry expansion is uh, the potential loss of about 20 acres of wetland, which will have to be permitted through all of their wetland processes through the Wetland Conservation Act, which can be through Stearns County, um, other agencies that might be involved with the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, the MTCA and DNR, kind of depends on when the regulatory or what rules are in place at the time that they're going to be doing the expansion because that expansion is you know, kind of laid out for several decades here. It's gonna kind of keep them rolling. Um, one of the other big things is the loss of habitat for you know, all the typical uh, birds, reptiles, frogs, you know, the blanding turtles, all those sort of things, which the uh, Martin Marietta will have to work with as the time expand, you know, when they come to the expansion time. So um, long, yep, long and short, they're kind of getting down here. The proposed project has no new infrastructure requirements, does not modify any of the current equipment or the aggregate process. Um, they're going to be staying within their operating within their air permit, um, you know, for their yearly thing and under the authority of the MPCA. Um, no structures will be constructed, no changes. So it's just kind of the mining will continue with their, their blasting and the loading and the hauling of the rock and using the existing tunnel under Highway 23 for the rainbow pit. So now that it's uh, kind of with all that information, it's kind of getting down to the council for the final decision of whether or not the EIS is adequate at the process and then we'll let the EQB and everybody know and then we can kind of stop at that point. So tonight obviously we have some Martin Marietta guys and all that stuff to be able to answer any questions you have. Council, any questions? Well, I just I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I read the documents that were in there, and I, I tell you, I couldn't read them all at one time. <laughs> it was confusing and long and just really, really difficult. So, And that's the um, abbreviated version. I'm, I'm just accepting that. There really are no substantial changes out there, and in my mind, um, I would certainly agree that the process is adequate at this point. That's why we hired Joel to, to do this on our behalf. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a process to go through. All right, any other questions? Otherwise, I need a motion. Well, I'd make a motion to approve the uh, final EIS for Martin Marietta North Quarry reduction and Rainbow Quarry expansion as adequate. I'll second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.
Oh, yeah, that Chuck Schneider is on this one. Oh. <laughs> I didn't put this. Okay. That's a good thing, Chuck. Thank All you. right. Uh, approve bills. Move to approve bills. I'll second that. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously. I don't have anything. Ms. Bonner, do you have anything? Uh, no, but I'm looking at Dave. When is the senior cookout oh, that's dates? that's August 11th. And August 11th is that? And yeah, then the tomorrow is uh, Night to Unite. Net, okay. And then um, the Wednesday the 11th is the uh, senior cookout. 11.30. Okay. Probably till 1. Got anything else, Dave? I do not. John? No. Chief Alshire. Minute. Mi last week, or the last council meeting about uh, some of the key issues that we're facing. Hold the mic here. down. Can you hear me? Yeah. There you go. Short guy, sorry. <laughs> um, just a little follow up on that key issue. Um, I've done some checking with the state fire marshal office on uh, policies that they use throughout the state <clears throat> for Knox boxes and Dama boxes and key boxes as such uh, for firefighting and uh, emergency situations. Um, so there is, um, has been in the past some issues um, with fire departments, uh, throughout the country um, as far as security of the Knox box system. Um, in Way Park here, I think we do a really good job. Uh, the police department documents uh, when they use the Knox box key. The fire department also documents when they use the key. Um, and we have our building security system, which kind of, you know, is another level of security for our Knox box keys as well as on the trucks themselves, they're locked. Um, but there is also a concern of, there have been instances throughout the country of uh, a rogue firefighter perhaps um, taking the key off the truck, going into a building or whatever and possibly um, committing a robbery or other bad acts that, um, you know, we don't want to talk about, I guess. Um, so I'm just uh, throwing out there, there's another level of security that Knox provides. Um, it's called the Knox Key Secure 5. Um, this is a wireless um, cloud-based um, system for gaining access to our Knox keys. Uh, something that would be put on the fire truck Everybody would have their own code uh, to access this key, and that'd be documented, it's time stamped when that key was used. Um, so I guess my question for the council is, is this something that uh, you would be consider um, to add another level of security to our Knox program, or are we comfortable with uh, the way we have our security set up now? Does that work on the Knox boxes we have out there at this time? So what this does is, uh, back in the day when you were on the department, we always had the little key box where we can get in and get our get the Knox key out, and we had our combination for getting that key out. Um, this replaces that, and like I say, then it's time stamped every time that the so key is accessed. So all the all the existing boxes have to be changed. Nope, this would be just on just, the trucks. Just that on the trucks, okay, but they are expensive. I would, I would suggest that if, if you, th I, think, I think I'm ha happy with what we've done. I don't think we've had any problems, Chief. I don't know that you've had any. I don't know, Chief, if you've had any, but. Uh, we I'm, we I'm, have not. I'm probably um, satisfied with what we have, but if you really think it's something, then it should be in the budget for next year. And yeah. I think it's something that we could talk about at a department level first. Yeah, so this is, um, again, um, Something that, you know, I want to see what your comfort level is on security of them. I'm comfortable where we're at right now. Okay. Um, but it is also something that, you know, is out there to add another level of security. And with going forward, putting more pressure on 
um, apartment owners and um, businesses to have the proper keys in place, I want to be able to guarantee them we got a high level of security so when they give us these keys that they have no concerns of, you know, any issues with it. Right. So. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Jim. Carla? Paul? All right. Nobody else, Council? We are adjourned at 7.15. <laughs>